All right, welcome everybody. We're so excited to welcome all of you to this is our launch event for uh, Free Speech Forward. So I'm gonna turn it over to my co-host and partner in this venture, Sue Chris, but we just wanted to welcome you all and just give you a sense of uh, what we're doing today and uh, you know, with this uh, new venture that we're starting here. So this is uh, Free Speech Forward. It's part of, uh, Chris and I started this kind of broader venture that we've been calling 1776 Forward that really is focused on the ideas and ideals of philosophical liberalism, just recognizing that these are important cultural values that we want to stand up for, speak out for, create a community around. And within that broader scope of thinking of philosophical liberalism, we decided to begin our efforts here by really focusing on free speech, that we just see that as a cornerstone bedrock of what it means to have a free society and what really is valuable and important and wonderful about having a, a free society is the ability to think freely and to speak freely and we wanted to be part of helping to create and cultivate a stronger culture around this value of free speech so that's what we're launching here today Chris will probably talk a little bit more that we really have kind of two big goals here. One is to start building a community around this value of free speech. So reaching out to those of you who've joined us today or who might be watching this video who already do agree with free speech and then hopefully taking this message out to even more people. And then along with building community, we wanna help people build skills. And specifically, we've decided to focus on the pillars of critical these as being crucial to what it takes to actually have a vibrant culture of free speech. And what we're gonna do today, we have two speakers from two top organizations. And I'm so glad that the two of the best organizations on free speech have sent us two of, I believe, their best speakers. And they're going to give us some presentations. That's going to be the first hour here. Then as part of this Zoom call, we're going to break out into small breakout rooms. So you have the opportunity to start meeting other people, uh, you know, talking amongst yourselves about these ideas. We'll do that for 15 minutes. And then we'll bring everyone back in for uh, the general Q&A in the main room. And just so you know, we, we generally have four guidelines uh, just to keep, for our own communication guidelines to keep the Zoom running smoothly. So the first is, uh, as, as I said, we're gonna start off with everybody on mute as we have our speakers, but then there definitely will be an opportunity for people to participate. Uh, when you want to uh, ask a question or share a takeaway, we just ask that you type exclamation point in the chat or we'll use the raise hand function and uh, Chris and I will call on you and unmute you to bring you on uh, when, when it's the time to do that. So that's uh, the first guideline is uh, type exclamation point in the chat, use the raise hand function. Second, we ask that you do keep it on topic. We're talking about free speech today. We're talking about critical thinking, communication skills, building that culture of free speech. So do keep it on topic. Third, we ask you to keep it brief, uh, just this we got a bunch of people coming on. So part of what we're even <laughs> attempting to practice is becoming better speakers ourselves and becoming more concise in our own speaking ability. So we ask that you try to keep it brief. And then lastly, feel free to disagree with anyone about anything, but keep it courteous. Because again, that is the ethos of the free speech culture. So now I'm delighted to turn it over to Chris. He'll say all the things that I probably forgot to say and introduce you to our wonderful speakers today. Great, thank you, Joya. No, actually, I think you uh, co covered all the bases and, and did a great overview. Um, as Joya said, uh, you know, maybe to just briefly add on, uh, we started this initiative under 1776 Forward and and kind of rooted in, in that date of the founding of America as kind of a pivot point for the values of philosophical liberalism. Um, and, you know, this, even this 
new initiative of Free Speech Forward, kind of our first focus under that umbrella on free speech issues. Um, it's really an experiment. So, you know, we are uh, looking forward to seeing how, how it plays out and how we build that community um, and be able to offer hopefully some, some useful skills building for our participants. But, um, you know, we're certainly gonna see how it goes and welcome to all, you know, kind of the ideas of our participants as well. One of the key themes of even 1776 forward, our broader umbrella movement is that we're kind of crowdsourcing the best ideas for activism from, from you, from our participants. So uh, we look forward to uh, seeing how even that manifests here through Free Speech Forward. So without further ado, I have the privilege of introducing our two distinguished speakers today, and then we'll kick it off and turn it over to them. Uh, first, our first speaker is James E. Petz, who's joining us actually, for those of you who joined, joined late um, uh, in this session, he's joining us from the UK this evening, so is uh, gracing us with his time a little bit later than the rest of us. Um, James is an author for Counterweight and a barrister in London who believes in the preeminent importance of reason in all aspects of life. His legal practice encompasses a wide range of commercial and chancery areas. And for those of you who aren't as familiar with Counterweight, um, Counterweight, the organization that James works with, is, uh, goes by the manifesto, Keeping the Lights On for Liberalism. They're a liberal humanist organization which values individualism, universalism, viewpoint diversity, and free exchange of ideas, while defending science, reason, and rigorous empirical approaches to knowledge production and addressing issues of justice and equality. Counterweight has been set up to focus specifically on critical social justice as a threat to all of those values, but opposes authoritarianism and censorship consistently. Our second speaker, Zach Greenberg from FIRE, is Senior Program Officer for Individual Rights Defense Program. FIRE, for those of you who are, aren't familiar, is the Foundation for Individual Rights and Expression. Um, Zach is, serves on the board of directors of the First Amendment Lawyers Association and is also a, a lawyer in the Philadelphia area and the Philadelphia Area Disc Alliance. FIRE's mission is to defend and sustain the individual rights of all Americans to free speech and free thought, the most essential qualities of liberty. FIRE educates Americans about the importance of these inalienable rights, promotes the culture of respect for these rights, and provides the means to preserve them. They recognize that colleges and universities play a vital role in preserving free thought within a free society and to that end, place a special emphasis on defending the individual rights of students and faculty members on our nation's campuses, including freedom of speech, association, due process, legal equality, religious liberty, and sanctity of conscience. So without further ado, I'll turn it over to James, who's gonna speak first and talk us through his presentation. Good evening. Um, we have a, a, a small but distinguished crowd, I see. Um, what I'll be discussing is um, the intersection between free speech and critical thinking. But before we get to that, just a few brief things about me. Um, I am the critical thinking and ethics lead at Counterweight. And I am one of the two uh, authors of a currently under construction course on critical thinking, which we're hoping to release in the early part of next year. And I've also written some articles for Counterweight on uh, sectarianism and universality, on reason and deceit in political and ethical discourse, and on individualism, collectivism, and selfishness. Do uh, go to the Counterweight website, counterweightsupport.com, and have a look at those and some of my colleagues' articles as well, if you're interested in any of those topics. My day job, uh, as uh, Chris said, is a barrister. And for those of you who aren't in the UK, um, a barrister is the approximate equivalent of a trial attorney in the US. So an awful lot of the stuff that I do for a living um, interacts with critical thinking in that one has to deal with uh, arguments and counter arguments at court and forensically deconstructing those arguments. And another one of the things that I do is train other barristers uh, in both advocacy and case analysis, uh, which is uh, effectively training people to apply critical thinking in a legal and professional context. And one of the things about uh, going back to counterweight briefly, uh, we've actually recently amended our mission statement, and I was involved in, in that work. 
Um, I think the the new short version of our mission statement is uh, promoting reason and freedom for the benefit of all humanity, which is actually very similar to uh, the 1776 Forward's own mission statement. So it is very nice to see some convergence between organizations in promoting the same thing. But it's the same basic idea, just expressed in, in slightly broader terms. Let's now get on to the meat of the presentation. I haven't put together PowerPoint slides because I think that um, power, death by PowerPoint is perhaps not conducive to the greatest uh, good for the greatest number. I think breath by chocolate is perhaps a little more uh, enticing. Um, but what we're going to deal with uh, in my presentation this evening is um, what critical thinking is, why it's important, how free speech promotes critical thinking, how and why cynical actors try to disrupt critical thinking, and how to respond. So let's start with what is critical thinking and why is it important? And this effectively is a very brief summary of a part of this critical thinking course that we're working on at Counterweight at the moment. So essentially, critical thinking is using reason to make decisions uh, and thinking carefully about using reason to make decisions. It doesn't mean always being critical in the sense of hostile, and it doesn't mean being unemotional or pretending that emotion doesn't exist. It's perfectly possible to be rational about emotion. So what is reason? Reason is a cause that relates to a goal. And so what is a goal? A goal is something that you or someone else or something else wants to achieve. If something motivates you to do anything. Ultimately, there's a goal behind it by definition. And having a reason to do something means that doing that thing will make you more likely to achieve your goal. So for example, if my goal is to eat cake, and um, to be fair, it often is, I have reason to go and visit a cake shop. Right? And we can have two types of goals, terminal goals and instrumental goals. Instrumental goals are goals that help you to achieve other goals. So if my goal is to eat cake, an instrumental goal might be to find a cake shop. So if I succeed in my goal of finding a cake shop, I'd be more likely to succeed in my other goal of eating some cake. And an instrumental goal can be instrumental to another instrumental goal in a long chain of goals, as long as there is a terminal goal at the end of that chain somewhere. And an instrumental goal in particular can be a good or a bad instrumental goal, and it can be different levels of good or bad. So for example, if my goal is to eat cake, an instrumental goal of finding a cafe selling only salad is not a really very good instrumental goal, whereas finding the cake shop is a rather better instrumental goal. And a bad instrumental goal is one which does not, in fact, help to achieve the goals to which they are instrumental. And there is such a thing as a convergent instrumental goal, convergent instrumental goal. And that is a goal that will help uh, to achieve a wide variety of other goals. So it's instrumental to lots of different kinds of other goals. And some examples of convergent instrumental goals are knowing the truth. Right? If I know where a cake shop is, I can find cake, but I can also, if I know where the place that I work is, I can go and find some money or go and go to work and make some money to get some cake. And having money is another instrumental goal. If I have money, I can buy cake, but I can also uh, buy some nice clothes. I, if I want to wear nice clothes, I can also uh, buy a car or I, I buy a house and have an oven to bake cakes with. Um, and having power over other people is a conversion instrumental goal. Right? If you have power over other people, there are lots of different things you can use that power to do, whatever it is, whatever other things you want to do. I can say, you over there, make me some cake. Um, and so a conversion instrumental goal is one that lots of people want to have. And of course, lot people generally want to know the truth. They like having money, they like having power over others, even if they're all their goals are quite different in other respects, because those are goals that help them to achieve other goals, whatever they might be. Now, a terminal goal, as distinct from an instrumental goal, is the most fundamental possible goal for anything that has any kind of motivation to do anything. It's the goal that ultimately provides for motivation in the first place. And it doesn't make any sense to think of a terminal goal as being good or bad for the thing for whose terminal goal it is. And that's because what it means for something to be good or bad for anything is precisely that which tends to fulfill its terminal goal. And if a thing doesn't have a terminal goal, it doesn't make any sense to think of something being good or bad for it at all. All right. 
And there's only very limited and very specific sense in which it's possible to have multiple terminal goals. And I put that word in quotes because I'm not sure that they even are strictly multiple goals. And that is if they form between them or among them a coherent utility function, which means that you must be able to compute those goals or probably better regard them as goal factors to rank the world or rank states of the world so that any given different possible states of the world can be ranked as either better, worse, or indifferent than any other state. So it must be transitive. In other words, any given thing must be better, worse, or equal. To them. And that's what it means to be computable. And really, the individual goals that form part of that utility function are not actually individual goals at all. They're just things that go into the wider function, because pursuing a function of different, a lot of different goals is quite a fundamentally different thing to pursuing any of those individual things as goals. This is all derived from optimizing algorithm theory. And it's quite technical in some respects, but it's really quite fundamental to thinking about reason and ethics. And it comes ultimately from uh, AI research, artificial intelligence research. And it's been developed in that field. People haven't really started properly appreciating how that impacts on the study of ethics, because ethics has traditionally been thought of in a very unscientific and very imprecise way that's actually fundamentally unhelpful. And I think that a lot of people haven't really noticed that there's this whole other field of AI research that's actually formalizing very precisely and very clearly things that are directly relevant to ethics. Um, but AI, AI research clearly is, and the, the optimizing algorithm theory is, and there's much to be said for having a look on Wikipedia or anywhere else and researching and learning about optimizing algorithms. We haven't got time to go into this in, in any more detail now, but that, just a heads up that that's an important area to think about. Now, the big question is what is the terminal goal for individual humans? And that's, that's the kind of thing that ethicists have long had a problem with, but I think that the, the, no one's really done proper research on this. And so unsurprising, there isn't a scientific answer. The most plausible candidate by quite a long way is that experiencing pleasure in the sense of not a specific kind of sensation, but any kind of experience that makes you think in and of itself, you want to have more of that kind of experience, uh, or other, otherwise described as being happy, is a terminal goal for a person. And that's quite different to the terminal goal for our genes. Right? They have a different and sometimes conflicting terminal goal of making lots of copies of themselves. And that's their terminal goal. Indeed, genetic evolution is why there are such things as goals and motivations and why there is such a thing as good and bad in the first place. And as is probably obvious, uh, the achievement of one person's goals or one optimizing algorithm's goals, it counts for genes as well, can conflict with the achievement of other people's goals. And the resolution or prevention of those conflicts is precisely what the field of ethics is and the, the study of the field of ethics studies. And reason-based ethics, which is you using reason to go all the way back to first principle and answer what does ethics mean, what is ethical, is a massive subject in itself and could do with an hour talk in and of itself. Um, we can discuss it more in the Q&A afterwards if anyone would like to go into it more interesting, in, in, in more detail if they found that interesting. But reason-based ethics is one of the really important things that I think is one of the liberal values that needs to be promoted. And one of the things that we're applying in talking about free speech. But it's not just other people's goals that can conflict with your goals. Other things' goals, as I said, your genes' goals can conflict with your goals too. And this is probably the reason that people are often irrational without any help from outside people, because their, their genes' goals sets off or, or has evolved systems in people's brains that, that cause them to behave in ways or cause them to feel compelled to behave in ways that aren't actually in their own interests. Again, this hasn't really been studied very rigorously. So this is, this is the best that can be done on available evidence rather than the kind of thing that one can say with the sort of confidence that one can have after detailed scientific study. But not just genes, right? But going back to the subject of AI, a sufficiently sophisticated AI might in principle have goals that conflict with your goals. And indeed, that basic idea is the foundation of the entire academic field, very recent academic field of AI safety. And that's well worth exploring itself after this talk. I do recommend uh, the YouTube channel of somebody called Robert Miles, M-I-L-E-S, as in the measure of distance, 
which is a very interesting thing to study and also really shines light on, on the foundations of reason-based ethics. The particular video I recommend um, the, to begin with is one called the orthogonality thesis. It's quite a long word. Just look up his channel. You'll find all the interesting videos there. So to sum up, you have a reason to do something if it ultimately helps to meet your terminal goal. And critical thinking is thinking carefully when making decisions to make sure that those decisions follow those reasons. And the better you are at critical thinking, the better you'll be able to, to fulfill and achieve your goals, whatever those goals might be. So in other words, achieving the very thing, the achievement which motivates you to do anything at all in the first place. And therefore, critical thinking itself is a convergent instrumental goal. Okay? Now, remember, your goals sometimes conflict with other people's goals. So sometimes other people have an instrumental goal of stopping you from doing critical thinking so that you don't know that your goals conflict with other people's goals and so they stop you from achieving your goals because those goals conflict with other people's. Now, acting on that incentive to behave in that way is fundamentally unethical. And we'll come on to why in a moment, if it's not already obvious, but it's a very common kind of unethical behavior. And it's the intersection between that and achieving your goals is where free speech comes in. So what do I mean by free speech in this context? In this sense, in the, in the sense that we talk about in the field of ethics, free speech is the freedom to communicate ideas or facts or to challenge other ideas or claims about facts without coercive restraint. Now, of course, it's possible, in fact, quite common, for people to communicate false information claiming to be facts or ideas based on false premises or bad reasoning, even without coercion. But fundamental to the principle of free speech is the understanding that the risk of misinformation, deliberate falsehood and incoherent claims is much greater when what people may communicate is controlled by coercion rather than when it's a matter of choice. And this is because whoever has the power to coerce, whatever their political views, maintaining and increasing that power <clears throat> is a convergent instrumental goal. In other words, whatever your political instrumental goals, you'll be able to achieve those goals, whatever they might be, more easily if you have more power. And therefore, any politician of any persuasion will always tend to try to increase her or his own personal power. And that goal, that convergent instrumental goal of increasing one's own power, for people who already have lots of power, will often conflict with other people's goals, such as everyone else's convergent instrumental goal of knowing the truth and applying critical thinking. So people who have power will strongly tend to use that power to get more power and to keep the power that they already have. And other people knowing the truth about people who have power, about how they behave, about the consequences of how they use that power, will often conflict with the powerful person's goal of maintaining and increasing that power. So powerful people have a strong in incentive to suppress the freedom to communicate true information and to engage in critical thinking, to question and challenge their ideas and their claims. And history has demonstrated, and I don't think you need examples, I imagine everyone here uh, well knows all the examples, that this power will be abused in every possible way at every opportunity by anyone who has that power. And this isn't confined to governments, although governments are the paradigm example of this. People with any kind of power, even a trivial or tiny sliver of power, are liable to use it in this kind of way unless there's some um, proper countervailing constraint that is powerful enough to, count, to, to counterbalance it. To give two examples of great many that could be made, directors of a company, for example, might abuse their power over their employees to prevent their business strategy from being questioned. So their shareholders don't realize they have a reason to remove them. They, they may punish their employees for speaking out or may compel their employees to falsify information, for example. Likewise, academics whose career success and therefore their own personal wealth and their own personal power over other people depends on being thought of by others as having an accurate and useful understanding of the world may abuse the standing in which they are placed to try to stifle questioning of those claims or to stifle the um, emergence of contrary ideas to those claims, ideas that explain the world more clearly than their own ideas. So although, of course, there's always a risk of people being misled without coercion, the risk of people having the wrong information is much higher when people have a strong incentive to 
uh, suppress the truth and promulgate falsehood are allowed the coercive power to act on that incentive. In other words, giving anyone the power to censor, uh, to prevent misinformation or harmful ideas, uh, harmful ideas, uh, is virtually guaranteed to do the exact opposite and positively mandate misinformation and incoherent ideas and to stifle the ability of anyone to question and challenge whoever has been given that power. And anyone who claims that it is naive to believe that people will be rational enough to work out what's true for themselves have it precisely backwards. It is naive in the extreme to think that anyone with a power to dictate what people may communicate will use that power to communicate truth rather than falsehood. Having what people communicate dictated by authority rather than by choice is inherently unsafe. And the, the behavior of suppressing questioning and challenging claims is common. And even by those who don't have a great amount of power themselves, right? there are lots of occasions in which I have personal experience, and I'm sure you all do, of being in conversations with people about something that might be totally trivial in the grand scheme of things, where you question the other person, and the other person has become evasive, erratic, or even abusive, when it's quite obvious that that person can't answer your questions. There are occasions when I've been putting posts on forums about model railways, about what color to paint the sides of your track to emulate rust, where I've asked people questions, well, why exactly do you say it should be this color? Why shouldn't you have a color that emulates rust? What exactly is scale color? When people have become ev ev evasive and eventually abusive about that when pressed. And that's totally trivial. That's nothing to do with, with political freedoms. But that demonstrates that that kind of power, the power of being thought of as knowing what you're talking about, is a convergent instrumental goal, and it is extremely common for people to abuse that. And that behavior is frequent and common precisely because questioning and challenging ideas and claims is so effective at sorting out false claims and bad ideas from true claims and good ideas. People wouldn't do it if it weren't effective, and it wouldn't be that kind of common if it weren't effective. If a person who claims that something is true obviously cannot answer questions, that any person who truly believed or truly knew the thing to be true would be able to answer, or can't answer questions about that claim consistently with other questions about other claims that person makes, it's very likely that lots of people will stop believing that claim, even if they themselves wouldn't have thought to ask the questions themselves. And likewise, if a person makes a claim who makes a claim obviously can't provide evidence to support some essential element of that claim when asked to do so, people are obviously less likely to carry on believing that claim, even if they wouldn't themselves have thought of asking or for that particular kind of evidence. So just seeing someone question someone and someone else be unable to answer those questions can be a really powerful way of rooting out bad ideas. Likewise, an alternative idea that explains the world better than the idea that's being questioned can make people reject a claim they might otherwise accept if they hadn't thought of that alternative idea. So again, the promulgation of ideas tends to make it harder for people to promulgate false ideas. And the people who know that their claims cannot withstand scrutiny have a really strong incentive to hide this fact by illegitimate means and use illegitimate means to prevent contrary claims from being communicated. And this is because, as I said, once it becomes obvious that a claim can't withstand scrutiny, people making that claim are likely to lose some of the power that they might otherwise have to influence people, not just about that claim, but about lots of other kinds of claims that that person might make. That person might just be thought of as less trustworthy generally. And even soft power, in even very small amounts of soft power, is a convergent instrumental goal because any kind of power is a conversion instrumental goal. And that's why it's really common for people when faced with scrutiny of their claims to try to disrupt that scrutiny. And there are massive numbers of different behaviors. And perhaps we can talk about various examples in the breakout rooms afterwards, but some general categories of examples are things like becoming evasive, so refusing to answer a question, invoking the ad hominem fallacy or one of the other fallacies, changing the subject, claiming to take offense, talking about something completely different, becoming incoherent, becoming very emotional, or alternatively, becoming hostile or intimidating, threatening somebody, a person shouldn't be carrying on the conversation, or interrupting somebody, just physically stopping the person from talking, or some combination of the two. 
And there are vast numbers of different ways of doing that. Uh, that the, the On Reason and Deceit in Political and Ethical Discourse essay discusses a number of those. And I recommend anyone interested in the topic to, to read that. And also the critical thinking course we're working on at Counterweight is going to go into more detail on some of those issues. But a really important thing is, whoever spots this behavior makes it lose its effectiveness on at least the people who spot it. So for example, if you treat people who refuse to answer a legitimate question in exactly the same way as you would treat those people, if they had given the worst possible answer to that question, people who have nothing to gain by refusing to answer questions. The principle is exactly the same as is the case uh, or as the way that, that many uh, jurisdictions deal with drunk drivers or suspected drunk drivers who refuse to take a breath test, right? Certainly in the UK, and I suspect in many other places in the world, they are liable to criminal conviction and punishment on exactly the same basis, exactly the same kind of punishment as someone who has actually been found to have been drink driving. And that's not because you can be really sure that anyone who refuses to take a breath test is actually over the limit. It's because the safest thing to do, given the deliberate suppression of the truth, is to treat them as if they were. And the same principle applies to people who try to stifle dissent or obstruct scrutiny in any other context. And the more that people understand and apply this principle, the more difficult it will be for people to get away with trying to disrupt other people's critical thinking. Remember, trying to disrupt someone else's critical thinking is harmful to that other person. It is a fundamentally unethical and positively malicious way to behave. And it needs to be recognized as such. One of the criticisms, I think, of a book written by a very well-respected person in this field called Helen Pluckrose called Cynical Theory, some of you may have heard it, is that the, 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 the thing that it, it doesn't address is why liberalism was vulnerable to um, this kind of authoritarianism that one's often seeing in the first place. An answer to that, I suspect, although it hasn't been scientifically tested, it really needs to be, is that many people who are otherwise disposed to liberal ideas were far too tolerant of people trying to obstruct scrutiny and obstruct reason and too tolerant of unreason generally. I think the, the eternal vigilance is the price of liberty. And the thing that one must be vigilant for is any form of unreason, any form of obstruction of scrutiny. People who behave in that way really should be treated as people who are in the same way as people who are deliberately telling lies. It, it simply isn't safe to, to, be, to treat things in any other way. Now on the subject of free speech, I defined it in a very specific way for reason, because the principle of free speech doesn't require that what people may say should be entirely without constraint. And a lot of very bad kinds of and incoherent kinds of criticism of the proper conception of free speech that I outlined earlier, actually try to use the point that um, there must be some legitimate limits to support things that are fundamental, kinds of limits that are fundamentally illegitimate. And so it's really important to understand and be able to articulate precisely and with principle exactly what those limits should be to be able to demonstrate that, that proposed things that go beyond those limits go beyond those limits without having to make the false claim that there should be no limits at all. And so it's legitimate to, make, to prohibit people from making false claims of fact, which they know to be false and do not believe to be true at the time they make them, providing that the question of whether it is in fact false in each individual case can be tested rigorously by a truly independent and rigorous legal system, preferably by a jury. It's also legitimate to prohibit forms of communication that themselves amount to coercion, and therefore that themselves can be used to suppress free speech, such as blackmail, intimidation, or deliberate personal abuse. And by the way, personal abuse is quite fundamentally distinct from just anything that people uh, find offensive. And not understanding that distinction is one of the things that, that uh, people who wish to suppress for cynical reasons suppress freedom of speech for cynical reasons, uh, cynically used to try to disrupt the scrutiny of their own false claims about free speech. Freedom is at its greatest when people's freedom to restrict others' freedom is effectively constrained. And that's why people in a truly liberal democracy with a rule of law are much freer than they are either in anarchy or in tyranny. And free speech is exactly the same as any other kind of freedom in that context. So in conclusion, knowing the truth 
and applying critical thinking are convergent instrumental goals. The more that you and everyone else is able to do this, the better off they will be. Having power over others is also a convergent instrumental goal, but unlike the first two, it's something that only very few people can ever have at the same time. Maintaining and increasing power over others often requires stopping those others from achieving their goals of knowing the truth and engaging in effective critical thinking. And so the greatest good for the greatest number is better served by stopping people from having the power to suppress or disrupt critical thinking or knowing the truth. This is best done by, uh, for example, very strict uh, and effectively enforced constitutional limits on the power of governments and other organizations that ha have coercive power over others, effectively enforced uh, legal prohibitions on coercive behaviors, widespread understanding of the principles of critical thinking, which is where the counterweight critical thinking course comes in, widespread recognition of the techniques used to disrupt critical thinking, treating people who disrupt critical thinking uh, in the same way as if they had frankly admitted trying to deceive people into believing falsehood, and understanding the importance of promulgating these ideas and spreading them to as many other people as possible. Fundamentally, freedom of speech and rigorous critical thinking need to be embedded into every aspect of human society for the world to be safe from tyranny and oppression. And by spreading these arguments and ideas, by consistently thinking critically yourself and encouraging others to do so, you can help to promote free speech and the net benefit for all of humanity that it brings. Thank you. Great, thank you, James, for that. Um, we will turn it over to Zach now for his presentation. Thank you, James, for, for that really wonderful summation of critical thinking, free speech, and your goals. That was really interesting. I think we all learned a lot from that. Um, I have to say I'm a little, a little less well versed in, 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 in goals and critical thinking and those um, kind of psychology of that. Um, as a lowly First Amendment lawyer in the United States, uh, in America, but I'll try to do my best to follow that up. Um, first of all, I just want to say hello, everybody. It's great to be here. Thanks so much for tuning in, and thank you to James and our hosts for um, just having this event. It's really great to talk about free speech um, anytime, anywhere. And um, I'm going to talk for around 20 minutes uh, real quick about just what free speech is, the, the culture of free speech, the values that allow free speech to flourish, and, and why those values are so important, and including with, uh, if I did convince you that free speech is important and why these values should be upheld, um, what we can do to, um, I guess, spread the good word about free speech, and both in our daily lives and our professional capacities um, as citizens in a democratic society. So uh, just going off, starting right away, um, Zach Greenberg, first one attorney of FIRE. Um, we primarily focus on defending free speech at universities and college campuses, although we are expanding um, nationwide, kind of serving as a PR firm for the First Amendment for free speech in America. We are um, nonpartisan. We will defend uh, your free speech rights, regardless of what you say, as long as it's protected uh, by the First Amendment, by the free, free speech principles here. And I just want to talk about what free speech is. And many people believe it's simply a matter of the words we say. And that definition is pretty limited because at least in America and generally understood uh, internationally, free speech is also freedom of expression. It is the clothes we wear, it's the movies we watch, the people we hang out with, it's the, the God we worship or not worship. It is how we express ourselves. And this principle is incredibly important because it is not only about creating, like James was saying, the best ideas for society and, and figuring out how we can make sure that the best ideas are heard, how we can innovate and, 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 and actually have a discussion of the most important facets of our democracy, it's also a matter of personal autonomy. It's a way that we can express ourselves and it's shown that people get tremendous joy by being able to express themselves, whether it is um, just the clothes you wear, the movies you watch, just being able to get out there and uh, let your freak flag fly, like we say sometimes um, in Philadelphia is incredibly important. Um, from everything from your favorite sports teams to issues of increasing importance, being able to express yourself is a matter of uh, personal joy for many people. 
But like James was saying, it's also how we resolve the issues that we come across in our society. We live in a very pluralistic world, hundreds of millions of people all sometimes going after the same thing. How do we survive? How do we figure out our goals and kind of come together and govern ourselves? And you know, you, people start in kindergarten and there's a common nursery where I'm saying, you know, sticks and toes break my bones, but words can never hurt me. But that's not really true because words are incredibly powerful. The words we say determines who lives, who dies, what laws we have, who rules over us, who becomes president, all that stuff. It's incredibly important to have the, the freedom of speech because it determines um, these really important societal factors as well. And so historically, it's been pretty clear that the people that have been in power, um, who are in power in historical societies, going back to the ancient era, medieval era, um, tended to suppress those um who criticize them whether it's kings and queens or even you, you can really just go back all the way even to, to socrates right the ancient greeks making him drink poison uh because he encouraged them to question the rituals and 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 functions of their society um you can go back to, to galileo question the catholic church being confined to house arrest then you can even go back to what's happening today in china and turkey and whatnot governments um, suppressing historical facts, Tiananmen you know, Square Massacre, for example, and just general um, opposition to them. And so the, the, there's always going to be an urge here for censorship, always going to be an urge to suppress people who think different than we do, who have different views, different ideas um, from those who are in power, the, the unpopular, the religious, ethnic, ethnic and, and political minorities of the world has suffered a long reign of censorship um, just throughout history. And the free speech developed during the Enlightenment by philosophers like John Stuart Mill and the First Amendment, um, commonly interpreted by courts um, in America really over the last 100 years, stands for this really radical idea that we should not punish people for thinking differently than we do, that we should not try to ruin their lives because they criticize us. And that's a pretty profound difference from um, just how the world worked for the last two millennia. And it's interesting because throughout history, it's always been um, violence, kind of the way we fight in the battlefield to determine who rules, who lives, who dies, what laws we have, you know, who becomes king, for example, in the medieval era. And now it's usually the ballot box, right? Power comes from the consent of the governed and how we vote, how we express ourselves. That is the primary currency that we use to figure out who rules in our democracy. And so, that brings us to modern day and the modern day um, conceptions of free speech really just involve how we talk to one another on a personal level. And the, the biggest, I guess, misconception about free speech is that it, 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 there's really no room for, for hate speech, for offensive speech, for violent speech. And um, under just basic personal principles, um, offensive speech is protected, right? This radical idea that we should protect speech that offends people is what we try to protect here at, at FIRE. It's what we try to upheld at college campuses and, and nationwide. And when we talk about offensive speech, we're talking about the worst speech out there, right? We're talking about um, you know, Nazis, racists, we're talking about sex, we're talking about just people denying to their existence, um, culture violence, but not actual true threats, of course, um, which are unprotected. And, and the, 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 the question is here, we're trying to answer is why do we protect the speech? Why do we let the, mar the Nazis march down in the Jewish neighborhoods? Why do we allow um, the bigots and sexists and racists of the world online, on Twitter, um, spouting their, their odious ideologies? And the answer to that, we say at FIRE, we believe is that the freedom of speech is a looking glass. It allows us to see the world for what it really is. And we are always going to be wiser and safer for seeing the world for what it really is. This is personified by a very famous um, speech by a, a, a neo-Nazi at Brown University in the 1980s, which is anecdotal evidence. Um, people were saying, why should we allow this person to speak in our community? Why should we allow Nazis to talk? And a Jewish student got up and he said to the class, if there's a Nazi in the room, I want to know who they are so I know not to turn my back to them. If there are Nazis in my community, I want to know who they are. It's my own personal safety that we allow the widest story of views in our society to be expressed. That way, I know who these people are. I know what the world is and who people actually, who actually think. 
And I talked to a lot of high school students. I actually talked to second graders um, a couple months ago. I'm like, how do I explain free speech to second graders, right? It's like really difficult to, to distill these concepts like uh, James, you know, uh, very adequately did and, and are very skillfully did that are that are complex and and convoluted. And how do we explain this to like regular people, right? And I regular people, people that are like nine years old. I said to them, like, look, your classmates around you, some of them might like you, some of them may not like you. Don't you want to know? Wouldn't you like to know who wants to play with you? Doesn't want to play with you? Isn't it important to you to figure out which people around you act, what they actually think about you, what they feel? Like, yeah, it does. And high schoolers like just want to know, like, who wants to take you to prom, who doesn't want to take you to prom, who hates you, who loves you. It's important to figure this out. But of course, in our in our society, you know, as an adult, as a professional here, um, just seeing the world for it is knowing what people who people are and what they think is incredibly important. It is it's so important that we should allow them to say things that may even be wrong or false or bad or, or, or harmful or, or offensive, because knowing that's more important than not knowing that. If somebody holds these views, then we should know who they are. We should understand where they're coming from here. Maybe we can even convince them. That brings me to the to the free speech culture, the, the, the second part of this whole thing, is that free speech is a looking glass. And what do we do once we see? Once we understand what the world is, what, are, what is around us, once we express ourselves, um, how do we actually function in society, right? Once you discover that all your neighbors are Nazis, like, what do you do from there, right? Um, so the, the primary free speech value, the free speech culture here, what we try to instill um, in college students, in professors and attorneys around the world is that it is vitally important for people to seek out those with whom you disagree, to get out there and actively in encourage yourself and encourage others to talk across the political aisle. For Democrats to talk to Republicans, liberals to talk to conservatives. Um, yes, even Nazis talking to Jews, even KKK people talking to black people. It is important to just to just have that dialogue, have understanding, have just a talk about it and to really understand each other because I understand the communication um, that builds trust, that builds commonality. And a large driver of hate in this country, at least in America, I'm sure on the world, is ignorance. And just the, the retreating into people's echo chambers, the not even in talking to those who you disagree with, is only going to fuel that ignorance and that hate. And based on studies that we've seen, and, and we have to see this every day, we also actually poll college students here at FIRE, um, students now are hesitant to to date those opposing viewpoints, to, to live in the same dorm with those that have um, differing political ideologies. And even in society, we see individuals just having a real hesitancy to associate with individuals who think differently than they do. And to me, that's just really detrimental to our society. It's really detrimental to our, our culture and our pluralistic democracy, because we simply need to be able to talk to these people. We need to be able to have a society where we're not killing each other over our views, which of course how the world was for around 2000 years, right? Religious heretics, the crusade, it's really a long history of just hurting people for what they believe in. But in 2022 in America, you know, 300 million people in the world, you know, billions of people out there, trillions of people, it is just, it is increasingly important to have the skill set and the knowledge to be able to talk across political boundaries and discuss um, the really most important issues with um, with individuals that disagree with you, and it's uh, and even as an advocate, right? Say you're an advocate for a cause. Say you're Planned Parenthood, pro life, pro choice. The issues that are coming up in society, uh, COVID vaccines, stuff like that. Um, being able to persuade those that you disagree with is the most important skill set you can have. It is it is something that they are not teaching as well as they should in college and in law school and just the, the ability to be able to not only talk to those with each agree with but be able to persuade them to have a dialogue about it um that's what free speech is all about we we try to teach people um that the way you argue the way you most effectively argue is but not by attacking straw man's arguments you attack their best arguments if you want to convince somebody that you're right you need to take them as they are understand what they're saying and attack the strongest argument and that requires you to very least know the argument to understand the argument that's what john stuart mill was famous for he who knows only his own side knows nothing of that as he as i'm paraphrasing him right now um going back to cicero in the roman times you have to be able to understand what your adversary is saying, what they're doing, and talk across these boundaries. 
And so if there's any, if there's any one, if there's any two things you take away from this talk right now, it is that uh, the freedom of speech, First Amendment, um, protects um, hateful and offensive speech for good reason. Um, seeing the world for what it is, the looking glass. And number two, it is um, to, to go out there and talk across political boundaries, seek out those with opposing views and not demonize them uh, for simply having these views and try to have a discussion with, with those. Who knows, you might find some more commonality, you might find um, common ground, being able to realize you're both human beings living in America, living in the world, um, and you can go from there. And uh, finally, I should just plug um, that, you know, we have a lot of information about free speech, about students' rights, and about the culture of a pluralistic, tolerant society um, at thefire.org um, on our website. You can check it out. Everything we do is free. Um, get in touch with us if you want to make your school better for free speech. If you want to talk about free speech issues, we are here. Um, this is my dream job. We do 24-7. We love it here um, every single day. And so uh, feel free to go reach out to us once again at thefire.org. And I look forward to discussing these issues with um, James and the rest of the um, audience here uh, further. Thank you, Zach. It's just a wonderful introduction to free speech culture and what it's all about and why it's so important. So now this next part of the meeting, this is the opportunity where we're going to give everyone a chance to speak. We're going to uh, break up into small breakout rooms so that everybody does have a chance to let their voice be heard. Um, again, I'm going to remind you of the, the, the guidelines that we have, which is, uh, well, not in the breakout room, you know, we're going to keep it nice and small. So, you know, you should just be able to, you know, speak up when you want, but do keep it on topic. You know, we're talking about free speech, critical thinking skills, communication, keep it brief so that everyone does have a chance to speak. And it's also your opportunity to practice listening skills, which I think is, as we even go on with this, more of our programming here, we'll, we'll think even more about how listening fits into communication. And then also feel free to disagree with anyone about anything, but keep it courteous. And Chris had some guidelines to share of uh, just giving you some prompts for things to maybe think about uh, to, to bring up when we're in the small breakout rooms. Yeah, sure. Thanks, Joy. Yeah, so I think, you know, this is meant to be interactive um, and, and how we get to kind of know each other and build this community. So um, I think some prompts are, things to maybe take into the breakout sessions with you first, you know, introduce yourselves, let everyone know who you are and kind of what, what brings you to uh, the free speech movement, what interests you on that. It might be interesting to share those anecdotes, maybe um, talk through some insights or key observations that you took away from, from the speakers. And then uh, perhaps as we prepare to come back for the Q and a session after the breakout sessions, um, if anyone wants to, uh, walk through quest specific questions they have for the speakers. If there's multiple questions within your group, um, it might even be a useful exercise to kind of come up with what you think is the best question or, you know, kind of a key, key observation or insight that you take away um, from the speakers. And then we can kind of use that as uh, 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 breaking off for uh, the discussion at the end. So with that, I think, uh, Joya, do you want to, Yep. Set up I a breakout. Creating breakout rooms now. Well, perhaps while we're while we're waiting, we can. Th there's one other thing that that um, I might mention while we are waiting, and I'll put something in chat. Uh, one of the things that Counterweight is is in the process of doing at the moment uh, is uh, preparing for a conference about liberal approaches to diversity, equality, and inclusion. Uh, the conference. I'll put the link in the chat now. I'm one of the speakers at that conference, on uh, along with the other creator of the uh, critical thinking course, uh, Isabel Marston. And we will be talking about um, critical thinking and sectarianism in the context of uh, diversity, equality, inclusion, or, or equal opportunities, as I think is the better way of describing it. Um, we've that's a conference, a little not quite the same as this, in that it's not live. We have a recorded session, but we will then be there to answer questions, I think, in, in the chat afterwards. So do come along and sign up for that conference. It's free for the uh, normal ticket. If you want to have a special kind of ticket where you get to watch the recording for a year off, because I think you have to pay for that. But um, the, the normal tickets where you get to see it for the day are free. And I do recommend anyone interested in the topic to sign up for that.
I'll share. Uh, I I signed up for that already. I think it's going to be wonderful. I'd love to hear, you know, maybe if uh, we're waiting while people are still maybe thinking about their questions, if you want to share just a little bit more about, uh, you know, maybe even like what you plan to talk about or, you know, what what is Counterweight's approach to diversity and inclusion? Well, I mean, to start with, it's in a sense, there's not necessarily one single counterweight approach because there are lots of different things that can be done. Mm -hmm. But one of the things that, that Izzy and I talk about in that um, recorded um, session is the need to understand that one is trying to address a real issue and the need to understand that issue with forensic precision, to use the tools of the scientific method to understand precisely what um, the issue is, to result to test whether any given thing is actually resolving that issue, to test empirically whether any given thing is resolving that issue, uh, and to use the information from those tests to inform what one actually does, as well as having a coherent uh, reason-based approach to what it means for something to be an issue in the first place, and thinking about it in terms of um, individuals rather than um, a sectarian collectivist idea, of people purportedly representing other people merely because they share some superficial characteristics with those other people. And the idea that um, the, the totally false idea that uh, employing one person of a particular um, in a particular group somehow represents all the other people in that group, or that because that person is in that group, um, that person must be assumed to have all the characteristics that are stereotypically associated with that group. When, of course, that, that just commits the, the fallacy of division, a fundamental logical fallacy, which um, is, uh, means that the, the, the claim is incapable of being true no matter what the context. Uh, and we deal with those various things. And also, um, I deal with some of the, the, the cynical reasons that people have deliberately to promote um, these false sectarian ideas in order to enhance their own power. And I think Izzy goes into quite a lot of detail about precisely how to use critical thinking to devise effective strategies for dealing with the issue. And I think the, the, an important thing is that the issue is properly defined, if you think about it carefully, um, as disparities between merit and opportunity. And it's all about how to use reason and use empirical rigor to minimize disparities between merit and opportunity. And I'm definitely looking forward <laughs> to seeing the, the full presentation. Excellent. Excellent. Yes. And anyone, anyone who wants to sign up, there's, there's a link in the chat there. Great. Thanks for sharing. I guess I, I can kick off uh, the Q&A session. I had one question for actually both of our speakers would be curious to hear your thoughts. But, um, you know, I think you both talked about the importance of everyone valuing free speech, of um, being alert to kind of the threats of towards free speech or means of censoring it. But I think most people, part of why we're here even is that there's a real sense in which this value is dropping in the kind of the minds of many. Um, so I guess my question is, what are some of the, what are some of the ways that you found effective in your practice or work to kind of raise awareness and encourage um, greater adoption of this as a key value, a key kind of cultural, political, social value among just people you encounter, people you're working with, um, just the general public, uh, you know, I guess, pick your audience. I'll let Zach go first since I spoke on the last point. Sure, happy to do. Yeah, that's a really good question. How, how do we show people the value of free speech? How do we kind of clear up misconceptions here and and kind of educate people what this means? And you know, we have we have curriculums for high school students and we have guidebooks and everything. But I think the the best way to illustrate a point is just by um, just kind of going through some exercises on like what it actually like what what, what this looks like in practice. We have a, a first mode orientation program for colleges where we have um, students who are in liberal arts majors kind of go up to the front of the class and and argue for a point they don't agree with just to show them that look this is possible you can do it you can present powerful arguments for things that um, you know you may not agree with at first just to show what's more about and to understand you know your adversaries who's a little better but when it comes to 
free speech as as a value, I think there are a lot of misconceptions out there, and and one of them is that it just it allows um, just the most more powerful people in our society to um, to gain more power, and they allow and they allows them to punch down and to kind of um, to destroy like minorities and you know use their use their rights to um, you know, suppress others. And, and this could not be farther from the truth. And I'm trying to illustrate this by doing a historical approach, showing how, um, you know, throughout history, it's always been the, you know, the kings and the queens and the aristocracy that had free speech, and the peasants who didn't. And even um, nowadays, you know, it's, it's, the, it's the billionaires, it's the, it's the pro- po- politicians, the presidents who are always going to be able to speak their mind. Um, but those who speak against them are the ones that are being su- suppressed. And you can show um, how hate speech laws in other countries are used against these ethnic and political minorities out there. Um, and even in America, um, how, how many, um, many liberals, for example, are very anti-police, anti, um, you know, law enforcement, and whatnot. And we can, I say to them, like, hey, what if you're, you know, these, these, these police officials that you don't like are given the power to punish hate speech, right? What if they're given the power to punish your speech? How would you feel about that? And our, our big argument here is that free speech is for everybody. It's a universal value. It's, it's an inalienable right, and it protects everyone equally. And it's really not about um, you know me versus you or liberal versus conservatives. It's really just about um, allowing people have the right to express themselves. And we try to do this by going to universities, by um, you know by having team legal education programs, you know guidebooks, and born a website fire.org. But I think this is the most powerful to do that is by kind of living these values yourself. Um, like when in college, we used to bring the liberals and the conservatives together for debate and discussion. We used to go to each of those meetings. Um, we used to provide food, it's, you know, bring people to, for debates and everything and, you know, have kind of, kind of show that even on the most controversial issues that this is possible. You can talk across lines, um, showing people what it means and kind of giving them a, a, a guide to doing that themselves. And, you know, hopefully it works. I think just being able to see that is believing it. And if they take anything away from that, it's that it's possible and they can spread it to their friends and their family as well. I think um, I probably have less um, practical experience of actually promulgating these things in in, um, the field than Zachary does. And I don't really have... Um, I tend to take a very strict forensic view of these factual questions, and I don't really have clear evidence about precisely what the best things are. So I can only say what I suspect is important. And I think there there are two um, things that uh, I think I suspect particular importance. One is one particular part of the, the presentation that I gave a moment ago, which is the principle that it is fundamentally naive to think that by trying to use coercion to suppress bad ideas, that one will have fewer bad ideas rather than more, uh, and that actually that is a fundamentally unsafe thing, and that that power will always be used to mandate bad ideas and falsehood. The, the, getting that particular message across is probably of critical importance. And the second thing of critical importance is making it very clear that um, advocating for free speech is not the same as advocating for some far right view, which I think is the kind of thing that some people get the impression of. Um, And I think you make it clear by demonstrating a commitment to free speech can be used in favor of things that are quite opposed to that, which the the, the far right people uh, believe. Um, And by fundamentally confounding polarization, I noticed for example, on the uh, 1776 Ford Facebook group, there's a little section at the side saying related pages. And the three that are shown are one called Patriot Watch, one called Patriots Live Matter, and one called Fact Checking the Fact Checkers. Now, I I rather doubt that especially the first two actually do have values that are aligned with those um, expressed in this group. But there's an algorithm somewhere that that (laughs) seems to connect the two, and that reflects a, a popular bias. And that needs to be dispelled robustly to make it plain that, um, the 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 sectarian warfare between the two opposing poles, especially in U.S. politics, but but other other places as well, which tend to centre around political parties. Right? These are just about personal power and wealth. Always, they tend to centre around who the political parties actually are, rather than anything that has any coherent principle behind it. Uh, are not the promoting that is not in the interest of anyone other than powerful politicians, and that being on one of those two sides is being a victim of others' abuse and not thinking for yourself 
is failing yourself and harming yourself. I think that that's a fundamental point to to get across. Well, as you mentioned, uh, just on the on the point of associated groups, uh, I think that's probably Facebook's algorithm at work. But you know, to some extent, that algorithm was designed by people, right? People who had who brought their own biases and agenda, to, you know, to the fore. So perhaps uh, that is some inadvertent or uh, even intentional association. Oh. Knowing what I do about how the algorithms work, which is, to say, not a huge amount, but in very general terms, how this kind of algorithm works, I very much doubt that the bias is actually encoded by the people writing the algorithm. Rather, the algorithm is one which will reflect the bias of the users of Facebook. Mm. Interesting. Because it's th these algorithms are based on um, data associations. So if lots of people who like pages... Uh, that have certain characteristics, certain keywords, like pages that have other characteristics or keywords, they will be linked by the algorithm, right? So the, the people writing the algorithm don't themselves put in the content, they just write the, the base, the, the form, the algorithm that, that d decides how the links work and the actual content are provided by users. So if lots of users who like pages with the words free speech in them also like words, pages with the words patriot in them, or pages that are linked to other pages, et cetera, and it can be much more complex than that, and I suspect it is much more complex than that, then those are the kinds of pages that Facebook will recommend to people who, who, who join a free speech page um, because it's based on these association of superficial characteristics. So it won't be encoded by the people writing the algorithm. It'll be a demonstration of the, the sorts of connections that, that, are, that the algorithm will find in the data set that it has to work with. I'll jump in and share that. That's fascinating to me. And I can share when, when Chris and I even started this, part of our initial conversations were even just recognizing the increasing polarization of the culture. And this was already, uh, you know, several years ago now. And, uh, you know, kind of how all of this even started with, was with us just sort of recognizing the problems of this increasing polarization. But to your point that if this is, you know, not even something that's driven by, you know, the the creators of Facebook, but by the broad pool of users that we know are on Facebook, I guess it even just suggests that how much uh, we all have our work cut out for us to really start to change the culture um, and to really get this message out about what free speech is, is all about. So, so one question I'd have for you, like it occurred to me as you were both speaking that uh, both counterweight and fire seem to be in, in this um, uh, period of growth, of, of, of expanding your mission statements. Uh, and so I'm, I'm curious to even hear you each kind of talk more about that, that, that it seems that, that both FIRE and Counterweight have recognized that there, there's this need to expand the, what the mission is and to reach a broader audience. And so I'd love to hear even more from, uh, you know, your own perspectives with your organizations, uh, you know, something maybe about your thoughts about how we start to change the culture in a really broad way and maybe uh, you know what each of your organizations are doing now that you're expanding your your missions and, and your focus um well i'll, I'll start um, i think exactly the little stuff mark but um the 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 count counterweight was initially set up by helen pluckrose whom some of you may have heard of to deal with uh, abusive behavior in and by in universities and other academic institutions to people who do not agree with or oppose certain ideas that are fashionable among the far left, certain sectarian ideas, um, which are often described as or surmised as uh, critical social justice. Um, I, it'll take a very long time to describe that. I recommend um, uh, an article written by Helen Pluckrose called how to be not racist, and you have to find the hyphen. Actually, let me put a link to that in the chat, bear with me for a moment. She describes it very well in detail there, and it, that's 25,000 words, so we won't be reading that this evening, but uh, do, do go and have a look at that. But sectarian ideas, in, in simple terms, um, which are um, promoted and are inherently incoherent and, and whose promoters use abusive, um, oppressive means to prevent people from questioning the ideas because they know they are incoherent and false. 
and that um, that's a very specific political issue that arose in relatively recent times in about 2010s. And Counterweight was founded because a number of people had been subject to systematic abuse and um, really quite serious consequences for them personally uh, as a result of that quite extreme abuse. And it was founded as a support organization for people who had been subject to that abuse. And as a result of that, the initial focus um, tended to be on abuse from a particular political perspective. That is what's often thought of as the far left, although it's really the conceptions of left and right are totally arbitrary, have no relation to principle, change fundamentally over time, and uh, I don't think are a meaningful guide to anything to do with actual principle of, of political or ethical thought. But what is often thought of as uh, left-wing politics, or at least what now passes for left-wing politics, if you actually look at the history, it, it, it means something quite the opposite to that. But uh, as, the, the, as we... Um, matured and grew and took in more people yes, in the organization to run the organization, many of whom themselves had been victims and had turned to counterweight the support aspect of things. We grew a community of people who um, had an appreciation that the problem was much broader than that. And it really isn't just about one particular political perspective. The, the issue is with oppression and unreason generally, and with um, the fact that uh, it the people who stand to gain in the short term from oppression and unreason were not being adequately checked by the people that one might think uh, ought to be doing that, by what ought to be regarded as very obvious ideas that allowing concentrations of power uh, and suppression of what people may say is fundamentally dangerous, that sectarian ideas are incoherent and harmful to everybody. And that it's necessary um, to promote much more general ideas and also um, promoting not only is it a matter of principle the right thing to do, but also focusing just on one fairly specific fragment of abuse gives the false impression that these ideas which are fundamentally rooted in principle are associated with one particular political pole uh, and may end up being uh, ignored by people who um, think that anything that is associated with that political poll is also associated with all the extreme things of the right wing, uh, just like the Facebook algorithm thought with the, the 1776 page. And so it's important to be very clear that um, the things that we oppose are not just one poll, but the fundamental underlying assumptions behind the entire polarization. And people who support one or other poll or see politics or the world through those polls, whatever that poll is, are wrong for doing so. And that the, the proper view of things is to start with principles and to start with reason uh, and to look at every detail forensically and precisely with reason and to accept and reject ideas on the basis of and only of reason. Sure, I just wanna talk a little bit about um, FIRE's mission, kind of what, what we try to do. Um, last 20 years what we're doing now and then i'll definitely like to riff off what, what james was saying um so since 1999 we've focused primarily on college campuses and trying to ensure universities are bastions of free speech that these um institutions teach students um how to think not what to think that they're able to support a wide diversity of ideas and views and that they adhere to their legal obligations to uh defend the First Amendment as public universities or as private schools, the promises they make to their students um, to defend their free speech rights. And so we've been trying to put ourselves out of business for around 23 years now. And um, with the problem is of course getting uh, a little worse when it comes to just the polarization like James was talking about and the general um, lack of a free speech culture in many universities. Though it is getting better in some facets, uh, speech codes, policies that restrict free speech are going down, they're being challenged in court, litigated against, um, legislated against, and usually many universities are becoming um, places where at least the their policies don't openly restrict free speech rights, um, even if the culture might, might do so. But uh, fairly recently, we decided to uh, change our name and um, go nationwide. Um, really focusing on uh, educating um, the public uh, about, about our rights. And 
really the focus is on uh, courtrooms, campuses, and our culture, right? Trying to ensure that um, in America, people overwhelmingly believe uh, in the right of others to freely express views different than their own and to expect that their laws and their educational institutions um, reflect and teach this belief. And so it's really just a matter of universities, society at large, on valuing free speech. And we do this through um, education, advocacy campaigns, um, just showing the value of free speech, but really start with the students and on universities, their student groups, um, having a university with a wide variety of student groups, allowing the student groups to advocate the views that define them and to show people what free speech is um, and what it isn't, is really what we're trying to do. And just going to what James was saying about this polarization, and I think this is really tied up with um, cancel culture, which is of course a term that has many definitions, but um, just putting one out there, just the, 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 the notion that we should in our society uh, punish people, make them lose their jobs, their careers, and kind of make them person non grata uh, because of their views or actions. We're really focusing on views here. Um, the no th this notion is um, really detrimental to a free society because it, it presumes, um, like James was saying, that those that have opposing views are, are, are not only wrong, but they're bad people, that they are, that we're demonizing them. We're, 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 we're having this discussion um, across political lines, but when we're talking to somebody with these views, the fact of their minds, we're thinking they're not only wrong, they, they're, they're morally bankrupt, that these views they hold um, are, are violent, they're extremists, they're the big, the big catch right now is a threat to our democracy, right? Um, undermining, um, or another another phrase people use is they're undermining the existence of certain other groups of people. And so it's a convenient excuse to, to use these terms because it means you don't have to engage them, you don't have to argue with them. If somebody is out there, you can label them as a, a democracy hater. You don't have to address what they're saying. And it's a convenient shortcut, but it's not really helpful to engaging, to engaging with them and persuading them. Because if you insult your adversary, you're not going to engage with them, right? You're not going to have a discussion with them. If you come up the bat saying they're an awful human being for what they believe. And so a lot of polarization really comes down to this, um, this in-group, out-group theory that people that are different than me hold these different views um, are, in fact, just awful people or just not you know, a part of our society. They shouldn't, they shouldn't be here. Um, and you can see this both on the left and the right, right? Trump saying people don't like America, can go back to countries they're from. Um, liberals calling Trump supporters such democracy, they should be thrown in jail, for example, or insinuating that they um, you know, are, are not part of our society. And it's becoming worse. It's becoming an issue that preventing people from talking across political boundaries. But I think the, the solution here, the way we support free speech culture and reduce polarization is finding commonality, finding common ground. And I'd like to just briefly tell the story of uh, Daryl Davis, um, who many of you know, may may not know, but he was a, a jazz musician who made it his mission, he's a black man, to understand the Ku cool Klux Klan, the KKK, what they're all about. And his whole theory was how can people hate me if they don't even know me? Kind of the, the root of hatred is ignorance here. And he made it his mission to learn as much about the KKK as possible. And he did this by scheduling interviews um, with current members of the KKK in, I believe, the 60s, 70s, and 80s. And of course, he was met with hostility. He was called the N-word many times. It was difficult for him. But once he started talking to these individuals, they discovered they had common interests. They, 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 some of them even liked jazz. And they would come to his jazz club and hear him play. And they would talk to him and his family. And he would go to their rallies. And they, they became friends. And to this day, he is the largest collector of KKK robes. He has robes of grand wizards and imperial dragons, state and federal level leaders respectively, because many of the individuals he met um, renounced their views, left the KKK and sent them his robes because they actually met a black man, and understood him for who he is and why he's coming there. And if Daryl Davis can talk to KKK members, um, your local Trump chapter can talk to Bernie Sanders supporters, your local conservative group can talk to liberals, your local Israeli group we talked the Palestinian group we can do it it's possible it's been done before you can do it again and it's really important to understand that this is this polarization now it's not the most extreme polarization we've ever had in our society right America had a civil war that happened right north fought south brother fought brother over the issues of slavery states rights we can go into that in a whole separate um, talk maybe next week um but you know we literally were fighting the streets right you know hundreds of thousands of people died in the civil war it was a big deal and so people slapping on twitter and having these sort of debates online um calling to the names 
um, even, you know, the, the acts of vandalism, it's bad. I'm not saying it's a good thing, but it's not the worst we've ever done. And we can get out of it and we become, um, you know, a more united society that can, that can kind of agree, disagree and talk across the differences uh, without a civil war and without killing each other. I'm confident in that, but I do believe it has to be through free speech. Um, it has to be through talking with those who disagree with it has to be part of this culture um and and this polarization it's gonna go two ways it's, it's either gonna spiral out of control or it's gonna you know it's gonna cut, kind of go down to um the manageable levels here so hopefully uh, with the great work that james organization is doing and what fire is doing um we can have a a you know a, a more tolerant political society um going forward well said. I think everyone, everyone here at least, uh, shares that goal. Um, and you know, it, it's interesting to hear you say that you guys made the decision a few years ago to kind of pivot to the culture at large. Um, so I, I'm just curious: Are you guys is is facilitating those types of engagements between opposing groups? Is that part of your your new mission as you kind of go beyond the university environment, or is that something you guys have thought about? Yeah, yeah, we 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 try to um, we'll run out a lot of our our new mission is excuse me a lot of it's mostly in the form of litigation. Um, we're trying to ensure that government actors outside of universities support free speech. We just had a lawsuit um, drop against the New York State Senate um, for blocking people on on social media. Um, just you know, government can't block its critics. Pretty simple like that. But yeah, we've enlisted, you know, athletes and celebrities. We were, we've established student, we're having uh, student groups, um, kind of we're guiding them to kind of have these kind of debate centered focuses here, bring in speakers, for example, and have, and have the um, discussions that, you know, show what free speech is all about. Um, so really focused on the kind of college level um, the, and then the, the, the nationwide level is the civil society at large. Um, yeah, it's, it's most litigation and education right now, mostly just advocacy like that. Um, but just like having these events right now, going to these events, doing more, you know, conferences, seminars, um, workshops like that, just getting in front of people, talking about free speech. Um, that's the biggest thing that we can do, which I'm grateful to you all, this event, for giving the opportunity to be here. Um, this is what it's all about right here. Exactly. So I guess we have a few minutes left. If anybody else wants to, uh, you know, ask any questions, again, you can always just put exclamation point in the chat or really just put your question in the chat at this point, if there's something you, you want to ask and you don't have a microphone to be able to ask it. And then otherwise, I'll just turn it over to Chris, if you yeah. have any last thoughts or questions and uh, want to take us Can out. I just say briefly, while we wait oh, for ahead. questions, I think I referred in the, um, in the talk to, uh, Robert Miles' YouTube channel about AI safety. I'll post a couple of links in the chat if anyone's interested to some of the more interesting videos about that. I've just posted them now. Yes, I'm definitely, I'm copying those. Uh... Definitely going to go watch this later. All right, Chris, did you have any last questions or uh, I guess you could uh, take us out here? I, I realized I was on mute talking to myself um, as I often do. Um, uh, thank you, Rena. We definitely will. Um, yeah, I was just pausing to see if any of our participants had any other questions. Um, if not, we can wrap up. Appreciate everyone who was able to join us. Um, many thanks to both James at Counterweight and Zach at FIRE for joining us for this really engaging discussion. I think, Zach, you, you put it perfectly at the end there of, you know, just kind of continuing to engage with each other through forums like this. And thankfully, with modern technology, we're able to do it across Stephen Oceans with James um, is, is what we're seeking to, to do and to start. And so for, for those of you who are listeners here, um, both live and uh, kind of viewing the recording. Uh, this is just the first of what we hope to be many such sessions. So stay tuned. Um, if you wanna follow us on any of our social media, again, the organization is 1776 Forward. Um, and then our website is 1776forward.com. We have a page there on the Free Speech Forward Initiative. We plan to follow up 
uh, with future events just like this one as we continue to build our community. And certainly we welcome your suggestions uh, or ideas on topics you'd like to see covered, speakers um, that you may know who are working in this area um, and recommend for uh, discussion. Um, we would love that. Again, we're all about crowdsourcing everyone's ideas, not really a top-down model, just uh, being led by Joy and myself. So give us your best ideas. You can email us uh, at hello at 1776forward.com.